Thank you, that's good. Well, thanks for coming everybody this morning. I wanted to lift up some of our missionaries. I haven't been many times out of the country, but I did go to Venezuela in 1988, and I really love that country because it was founded with an American system of government. Simon Bolivar, Bolivar helped set it up, almost an identical constitution, an identical uh, declaration, sort of independence type documents. It's been destroyed by socialism. It is an absolute fiasco down there. And Jason and Sarah Sykes, our, our missionaries to the Dominican Republic, began in Venezuela and they did everything they could but political discontent and then you add skyrocketing hyperinflation, power cuts and shortages of food and medicine, they had to come back to the United States. Their heart was still for the uh, people in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and, the, and also in Venezuela, and so now they've gone back to the Dominican Republic to set up a seminary with a vision of training uh, local pastors for the entire uh, South African area. Uh, their sending church is Lighthouse in Chattanooga. They are through BIO, our missionary outreach, and we've supported them for 14 years. So you're doing good work in a very, very needy part of the world that's been very much assaulted and attacked, and these people are willing to go, and we need to partner with them. Well, go to Galatians 5. We're in Lesson 5 today of a series called God's Amazing Grace. We went through Titus 1, 2, and 3. We went through some other lessons. Uh, we're going to be swimming around in Galatians today, and the title of the message is Liberated Living. If you're free, if the Son whom the Son hath made free is free indeed, we need to know free from what, free to what. And Galatians 5 talks about the antithesis of bondage and slavery in your thoughts and your actions, but... This will be about liberated living. You know, we have songs that talk about that. Uh, Jesus came to set the captives free. It says he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the captives free. Uh, Satan, conversely, wants to enslave you, primarily through your mind. As a man thinketh or a woman thinketh, so is she. And out of the heart proceed the issues of life. If they can capture your mind, you'll do whatever your mind uh, focuses on. Satan is not primarily looking for casualties in the war against Christian believers. He's looking for converts. He wants to see who he can enslave. And he's changed the words of our world. We use uh, gospel words with devilish dictionary applications. For example, liberty and freedom. Uh, if I hear one more doctor talk about as he drives his $80,000 car to West Knoxville that his abortion clinic is for reproductive rights and women's health care, I'm going to throw up. Killing children is not reproductive rights. Uh, in giving women a disaster and a post-abortion syndrome in their future is absolutely a disaster. But the English subtitle is the right to live like alley cats and kill any children that get in the way. That is not freedom of any kind. What about freedom of the press? That sounds good, but before you know it, if you don't have boundaries or wisdom, uh, you have a lot of dirt spread out and everybody acting like that's the greatest example of press freedom we've ever had. No God stuff, America says, just give me freedom. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and you're in my way, and you're irritating me. Uh, people want to cast off all restraint, but the one who gives true freedom comes to take over. He doesn't come to take sides. So look in Galatians chapter 5. We'll bounce around in Galatians today. Verse 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we want to learn the Christian concept of freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to divide it into two points today. This may not be an official Baptist sermon. It's only got two points and it's only on half a page. But it's very good. First, we're going to talk about the dimensions of a life of liberty. You take the dimensions of something in your house, height, width, depth, and you get a cubic uh, uh, estimate of how large or how productive this is. Uh, that's the idea here. In what areas of your life do you have liberty in Christ? How far does that extend and how high does that go and how far back does that go? First, we're going to talk about the dimensions of a life of liberty, then how to do it. You can plan very well to walk free in the Lord Jesus Christ and have a wonderful Christian life, but you don't have the power to do it, and I don't have the power to do it. So we need the dynamics you know, there's all sorts of words for energy in the New Testament. Zoan that we get zoology from is biological life, and uh, energes is energy, and, 
and uh, dunamos is dynamic, explosive power. That's what we need in a wicked world to live a life of liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take the first point here. The first thing we want to talk about are the dimensions of a life of liberty. From what are we liberated? Look in chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 6. Paul says there, uh, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. That person is deserting Paul and his gospel. Look in verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and that would pervert the gospel of Christ. We have deserting and we have perverting, and they're linked. Why would you desert the gospel of Christ? Because you've been taught incorrectly, obviously. You have been taught a perverted gospel. Did you know that? Satan is a pervert. He perverts and switches good and healthy things and puts them into a form of wickedness to tempt and destroy you. Somebody said regarding Satan, he originates nothing. He has no original material. He can only take that of God's which is right and good and twist and pervert it. So the first thing we're talking about the dimensions of a life of liberty. In Christ, you'll have the ability and the plan and the power to be free from the bondage of legalism. In the book of Galatians, you're aware that uh, people were coming from Jerusalem that said that if you want to be a Christian, you have to follow the days and dates and feast and fast and rites and rituals of the Jewish religion. And then you could talk about maybe becoming a Christian. Well, that wasn't right at all. That's a perversion of the gospel, and it's a form of legalism. So again, we're first free from the bondage of legalism. Question. Why would the devil rather pervert the gospel than deny the gospel? Because having a perverted gospel, the bad effects of it will go on and on and on as you think and do wrong and your kids think and do wrong and your husband and your wife are tempted to think and do wrong. The people in your community and the schools and what they teach are now wrong. You may put your faith, if you don't watch out, into a substitute gospel and become a synthetic or fake Christian. Uh, God presents a true gospel, and it's the one and only. Uh, that's not true for Satan. This is Satan's substitute. Look in verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Have you seen all these debates in uh, the television and the political fields today? And uh, the, they say very seriously, they say, well, we need to give him time to present his truth. That doesn't make any sense. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. It is, universe, it is only. Uh, a good preacher said once, if it's new, it's not true, because one of the marks of a true position is it doesn't change. C.S. Lewis said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. So something that morphs and changes and goes from one to another is not true. And as a matter of fact, here in Galatians 1.8, Paul says that that person is not a clever friend He's not someone that we want to necessarily primarily dialogue with. Don't get mad at your enemies. They're, not, they're just believing the wrong thing. But this is uh, very serious. He says, if you believe that gospel, any other gospel, than the gospel of the free grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, a legal transaction by which your sins are placed on the back of Christ and his righteousness is charged to your account, and a life transformation where you're born once wrong, and now you'll die with Christ. We'll study that here in a minute in Galatians 2.20. And you receive a new life. So you have a legal transaction by which you were made free from a debt you couldn't pay. And you have a life transformation to give a new life in Christ, which you could never uh, produce by your own effort. This is pretty strong. He says anathema, damned, cursed. He says, this is not mere preference. This is the message of God from heaven. And for you to tamper with it is absolutely, totally wrong. It'd be better to go into science or accounting and insist that two plus two is five than to jettison or pervert the gospel of Christ because it alone is the gospel that saves. And he alone is the savior who saved. One who does that is worthy of God's greatest condemnation. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's being very sharp. Look in verse nine. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. 
Again, if it's new, it's not true. In theology, the last five or ten years, there was an attempt to get away from the Pauline doctrine of salvation by faith in alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. And it was called the new perspective of Paul. Logically, if it's a new perspective, it's wrong. You need to find the old, old perspectives that came down from heaven and was articulated in the early days of the church by the apostles and by Christ himself. That is the right, it's impossible for something to be discovered in 2023 that is accurate because that would mean that what was brought at first was not. So we have to go back and find uh, our truth in the uh, initial application and the initial preaching of it. Verse 9 says, we're not trying to please men. And uh, you say, but they're very nice men. You know, you, I'll tell you this, I, I do sometimes ser uh, seminars on Mormonism. If Mormons, if anybody could get to heaven by being nice, it'd be Mormons. They're some of the nicest people you ever saw in your life. I grew up in Missouri, which was our LDS, uh, reformed, I think, LDS. It was the group that stayed behind when Brigham Young headed out west, and this was Joseph Smith, who was killed in the jail at Quincy, Illinois. And, and you, you want to talk about the nicest people in my high school class were John Hanks and his brothers, and they invited me over for Friday night firesides, I think they call them. I could have easily been brought up. Praise God, it didn't draw me into Mormonism because it was, it was about the nicest people I've ever met. Well, people aren't saved by being nice. Uh, Romans 3.20 says, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. This is not preference. It is realities pertaining to eternal destinies. Again, it's not the messenger that validates the message. Uh, when you hear from somebody and they're a nice person, I hope they're telling you nice things, but they may not be. If you've been to talk to somebody and they've been to a good school, I'm glad they have. Education is certainly a good thing, but it's not determinative in the area of salvation. And you say, well, we've known you a while. You haven't robbed too many banks or kicked too many cats or fussed at your children too much. Well, <laughs> that's very good. But that still doesn't validate the message. The speaker doesn't validate the message today. Uh, if you watch certain channels on TV, they tell you that angels appear in full glory at the Motel 6 or the uh, La Quinta Inn and wherever they're staying and say, behold, I have a new message. Well, then it's wrong. It's absolutely guaranteed to be wrong. A industrial strength real angel could come into your uh, house and say with a voice of thunder, blessing, son of man, I have been dispatched from heaven with a new message and a new gospel. Listen to me all. You could say it's wrong. I don't even have to listen to it. You're absolutely wrong if it doesn't square with God's word. Paul says very straightforward, verse 8, that person should be accursed. Now, you and I would be hesitant to say that, but Paul says that. Look in verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You have a choice to make, a message from heaven to earth by God to men and women, or something that's been whipped up in a good American fashion or adjusted. And uh, I remember when we studied the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, we went to New York one time and saw that Watchtower Bible and Tract Society building on the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge. It looked very impressive. It looked like a military fort. God didn't live there. God, did, God came down in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not an organization, not an end time, uh, 10 tribes of Israel, 12 churches, uh, like uh, the Mormons would do. And all of our nice friends, our very good friends at work, say, now, now, let's don't get too excited. All roads lead to heaven. The problem is they don't. That's uh, just the one fly in the ointment on that. So we're focusing on the gospel. What authenticates the gospel? What shows the gospel we have to be real and true? Look in verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that increases the authenticity and the authority of this gospel incredibly. First off, Paul is either crazy or he's right. There's no room in between when he says, this one wasn't preached after man. This isn't a human gospel. Step aside, boys. This is not your gospel that you're making up. I didn't receive it from men. I didn't uh, taught it 
from men by implication, but the, by the revelation of Jesus Christ, by the apocalypse the unveiling of Jesus Christ. That's pretty strong. That is a very strong Galatians 1, 11, and 12. So here's the source test. Question, where did you get your gospel? Uh, when you take, uh, and don't do this unless you're trained because it's very easy to get tangled up. If you take your Bible in one hand and your Book of Mormon or your Doctrine and Covenants or Pearl of Great Price in the other hand, and you show there's a difference, they say, well, yes, there's a difference because we, we're new and improved. Well, where did the first one come from and why is it uh, in need of correction? Uh, the gospel here is not the invention of man, according to Paul, not something Paul thought up, but something God sent down, a God given gospel, not man's invention, but God's revelation, divine and direct. Remember, we're talking about the dimensions of the life of liberty and that we're free from the bondage of legalism, that a gospel of grace has come down from heaven. We should believe it, number one, because it passes the source test. It's a heavenly gospel. Number two, it passes the salvation test. The gospel is also the one that Paul taught and that we believe is also authenticated by the salvation test. Question, how were you saved? You can ask people here in good old East Tennessee, how were you saved? And I have known some of these people for 30 or 40 years and, and treated them and, and been with them in the hospital and thought I knew them. Their eyes will start looking around and they say, well, I'm living awful close. And I go, oh no, I hope you're really just confused today. But if you're gonna tell me that you and I have shuffled around a little town in East Tennessee and just lived the perfect life from heaven and we deserve to go to heaven. That is pathetic. That's, at least it is in my case, that is not gonna happen. But you know what? I, I rejoice, I, I've told you about some old farmers that are rough and tough and some tough old women too that you'll ask them why they're going to heaven and their face will change in a minute and they'll say, I'm no good. I think that's a great start. <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna say next, but that's wonderful. I'm no good, but God saved me when I was 17 and we had a revival out and they let school out back over in Granger County. And I said, all right, you can go on, but you're in. You're absolutely, I, then they said it was another, it was Christ, he saved me. His work on the cross. I said, well, that is wonderful. You can die happy, not that I'm telling you to die, but you can die happy. Number one, Freedom from the bondage of legalism is shown by the gospel of grace, which passes the source test. Number two, it passes the salvation test. Look in uh, Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into what? The grace of Christ, not simply the example of Christ. We believe that Christ is a wonderful example. He will show us what to do. The problem is we don't have the ability to do it. His grace is involved in giving us the repentance and the faith uh, to turn from ourselves and turn to the finished work of Christ. You know what they call the uh, anything other than the grace of Christ? It says here in verse six, another gospel. That is rough stuff. Do you see any gospel that is not the gospel of grace, salvation by God's good pleasure extended through a faith given to us that we can trust the Lord Jesus Christ and make that great transaction, that great substitute, that is the true gospel, and we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And boy, you've got to keep that alone. Just a little warning. Uh, do you have Catholic friends? I do. They're some of the sweetest people I know. And they believe in God, and they believe in right and wrong, and they believe in the Bible. I like that. And I'll say, now, Bob, I just want to make sure we're going to the same place because we've been good friends down here a long time. We don't want to split up here. Uh, and, and you'll get a long way. You'll get uh, God's good, and Christ is the Savior and saved by faith and grace. And the key word is alone, alone. Do you have anything else that you're trying to add? And uh, it's, a, I mean, yeah, this is your friend and you love them and you talk to them as nice as you can, but you just can't let them add any other thing. No tradition along with revelation. Finally, the subject test. This is the one that pops in my mind when I talk to somebody about the gospel of Christ. The source, it's from heaven. The salvation it brings is a substitutionary salvation without works except Christ's works, not yours. 
But it says finally in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel your son removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. The grace of Christ is about him, the life, the death, the person, the resurrection, the burial, ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel not of you, not of your effort, not of your, your best friend. It is the gospel of Christ. Salvation, number one, here's some things that salvation by grace through faith is not. It's not about a creed. This is always tricky. Uh, I have several friends that have been saved by the plan of salvation, the tracks. They're, they're wonderful. But I tell you, in a sense, nobody is saved by the plan of salvation. They're saved by the man of salvation that the plan points to. You say, well, nobody sure would believe. No. Remember, Satan believes every word of the plan of salvation. I'm not, nothing wrong. You, you give that plan. You talk about all of sin, and you talk about the wages of sin is death, and that God commendeth his love to us, and that uh, we are saved by grace not and through faith, and that not of works. That's absolutely true. But you, 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 could, you, could, you and I could go to Tom, Tyson McGee Airport, and I'll say, they see that plane, you hear that whine, oh, those mighty engines, and that sharp-looking captain and co-captain, and uh, everybody getting on and off. They've done it all day. The plane's flying great. Man, I believe in those Rolls-Royce engines. I mean, I believe in the, uh, the ability of these people. These, some of these pilots were military pilots. They could sleep halfway across the country and still land that plane without even breaking a sweat. And you say, I believe in it too. Yeah, man, yeah, I believe in it. Go American Airlines. Go United. I say, okay, let's get on it. No, I don't think I will. <laughs> I think I'll just stay here and watch you. There's a difference between believing the facts about something and trusting your life. When you get on that plane and the door closes, it's a totally different level of trust. That's the idea, not just believing a plan, but trusting in the finished work of a man. That's the idea. Not a creed, not a code. You say, I believe in living right. I'm glad you do. I want more people like that in my county. Uh, but that won't save you. Works won't save you. And the insurer announced. You say, but a cause. I'm a tender-hearted, sweet person. We're glad you are. Most people are not. I'm glad you are like that. That won't save you. Uh, all our righteousness, as it says in Isaiah, are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf. And our, our inequities, like the wind, have carried us away. It's not a, a good church. You say, oh, church is very important. It sure is. But church, in that sense, won't save you. Uh, you can push a tricycle into a garage all day, it won't turn into a car. I mean, you just it, there's no transformative power about a church building or anything. It's where the uh, ecclesia, the, the uh, called out assembly meets, and it's a wonderful place. Salvation is not a creed, not a code, not a cause, not a church. Salvation is Christ, one mediator, God and man, Jesus Christ the Lord. That's why uh, Acts 4.12 is such a wonderful or offensive, take your pick, Verse, for neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given unto men whereby we must be saved. Now, that is a divisive verse. Um, it's not meant to be divisive, but no offense, no effect. What your message is a salty message, and people have open wounds. The true gospel, the sources of God, the salvation is by grace. The subject is Jesus Christ alone. How does that liberate us? We're going to get into that here in a minute. If you don't understand that you're saved by grace, even if you are, you'll try to hang on by legalism. Grandpa went to watch the planes take off at McGee Tyson, and he heard your story, and he knew that you got on and off the plane. And finally, praise the Lord, he got on the plane, and a few hours later, he was in California. They said, Grandpa, how was the flight? He said, well, it's a good plane. I'm glad I make it, but I never put all my weight exactly on the seat. He was just kind of jumping up. He didn't want to rest completely. On. He'd already gotten on. He was, going to, he was in the plane. He'd made his choice, but he was being silly. He didn't enjoy what was given. Remember the immigrants that went over on the uh, great steamship, maybe the Titanic on its first run or something. They went from one city to another. And uh, they finally let him out of the steerage capacity that didn't have any money. And uh, they said, oh, can you give us something to eat? We're starving. And he said, starving? Why are you starving? He said, well, we just barely had enough money for the ticket. He said, the food is included. The food is included. That's the idea. When you're saved by grace, 
there is just a tremendous benefit that comes with that. Uh, thank God you and I are saved by grace, and that frees you from a yoke of legalism and self-effort. Uh, you having no confidence in yourself gives you great confidence in that you have looked toward a substitute, and now you are surely and safely on your way to heaven. You having confidence, well, I'm improving, I'll tell you that. I don't cuss more than three times a week. Last year it was five. I'm, in a, I'm a new sort of fellow. Yes, I am. <clears throat> well, you're so, you're so blasted proud, you're not going anywhere up. I don't think that is a horrible, hard attitude. Uh, and that, that won't save you. Your pride stinks more than whatever other sins you were tempted by. You can be confident and you can be a good testimony to the salvation by grace through the Lord Jesus Christ when you don't trust in yourself, when you trust completely in the finished work of Christ. And that kind of person can be an exclamation point Christian instead of a question mark Christian. No, I love you if, because, or when. God's love is unconditional from man's point of view. It is. Uh, Romans 5, 8, for God commendeth his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the idea. Not when I got shined up, I reached, reached level three of the good boy mode. Now God will be really proud to take me in. No, he won't. He just, he's, he's trying to break you down where you'll quit trusting in yourself. That's the idea. Uh, he is, God is love and the initiator and sustainer of that love. God's love is an action from heaven by God toward us, not a reaction to you and you're trying to impress everybody. Not based on what we are or what we've done, but who he is and what he has done for us. That's the idea. We don't put ourselves in a position so that God feels like he has to love you. He loves you at first, kind of like you love your little boy when he's rolled in the mud. You, it's, you have to hold your nose, but you do love him, and then you'll clean him up. The grace of God will change and liberate you. Remember where we are. This is a big porch. There's a small house behind it. I will make it by the end of the lesson here. The dimensions of a life of liberty. First is you are free from the bondage of legalism. I didn't come from a legalistic background. I came from a completely secular background. We all thought we were pretty good. We didn't like following rules any more than anybody else. We just thought we were okay. You may have come from a very legalistic background where you had to initiate, obtain, and hold on to your salvation by your effort. And the best thing you can do is to learn that that's impossible, and I'm sure you have by now. Number one, freedom from the bondage of legalism. Number two, this is more on a personal day-to-day -day level, free from the bondage of criticism. Look in Galatians 2 and verse 4. And that because of false brethren's unaware brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Somebody comes in and either thinks you're initially saved by your works. Remember the silly story we told about going across the stream with the boat and the two oars. One's your God's grace and the second is your effort. That's not true. These people are uh, Judaizers that have come from Jerusalem to try to press you back into the mold of the Old Testament. And the law of Moses, which no man could bear, they wanted to load on your back again. Jesus Christ alone, having followed that law of Moses. What's this? This is big shots from the denominational headquarters. Sounds like you are rejoicing in your liberty that all the righteousness that's needed to satisfy God was substituted on your behalf by the work of another, the Lord Jesus Christ. A perfect human life did everything the law demanded, did nothing that the law proscribed or prohibited. Absolutely, when you get to in your filthy state to the edge of heaven and they say, why should we let you in? You say, I'm with him, I'm with him. That's what that the, he has offered that his cleanliness and his holiness will substitute for mine. You could call them da -da 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 -da, grace busters. They're gonna go, whoa, you quit having so much fun. Calm down, get grim again, because you have to earn this. And you'll go, I don't think so. I failed that a long time ago. That's off the table. I will live, uh, I will live for Christ now, but that's different. I cannot work my soul to save that work my Lord has done, but I shall work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. That's the idea. That's the idea. The law, it says in John 1, you remember, came by Moses, but grace and truth came 
by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea. The law, and we studied this, is not an instrument of salvation. Let me give you an example from my world. A stethoscope will not cure your pneumonia. It is to diagnose the pneumonia. I can't listen and go, shazam, and then you're better. <laughs> I wish I could, but you can't. That, uh, diagnostic tools are not for curing you. Okay, that's, what does the Bible say about the law? Number one, the law is a mirror to show us our wickedness. It holds us up, and before you go out of the house, you go, well, good heavens. I didn't realize in such bad shape here. I better go back and try to clean up, and you'll realize pretty soon you can't do it. The law is a mirror to show us our wickedness, and then it is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So it, is, it doesn't save by itself, but it will... It will show you what's wrong with you, and it will lead you out and away by repentance and then faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ to an opportunity to have a new life. But it doesn't by itself save you. The law was never intended to save you, but to show us what we needed to be saved. The Mormons go to our the temples, the great temples that they're building. The first one was in Salt Lake City there, and they're beautiful temples. They go through secret ceremonies and rituals, and they learn about 400 new rules. Well, I'd want my money back. I'm just telling you. If I went through all this and went to temple recommend uh, classes at the local stake, um, and again, you never met any nicer people than Mormons. They just need the finished work and the righteousness of Christ. But when they did that and they go in there and they put on a robe and they go through all these ceremonies, and you can read about it, and a lot of books have been written by former Mormons that have come to Christ. And you know what you get at the very end of it? More rules. I'd go, is there an exit from this building? <laughs> I don't need this. In the Old Testament, the Pharisees studied the list of the law and added more to the list. Some people estimate they had 613 requirements. You know what they were doing? They were checking their list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. That's what they're doing. That's not going to work. That is not going to work. You know what? Paul knew exactly what they were there for. He didn't budge an inch, that critical brunch. He said, you are false brethren. And you know where that list came from? Inside an organizational church. A lot of times today, churches that are pretty normal will go off into some legalistic direction because everybody's gone to some seminar by some high-powered person and gotten wound up really tight in bad doctrine, in salvation or sanctification by your own effort. Now you have to make decisions and try. We're not robots, but still, this is not something you initiate. They are wound up now, super tight, ready and willing to wind you up too. I mean, they're gonna this is the way we're gonna live. They're not talking about God's commandments that Christ will live through you and you'll be able to fulfill some of the law much better than you did before, uh, realizing it's not about you, it's about him. No, these people, either at the beginning or in the middle or the end, are going to major on minors. They're going to externalize all their preferences. They're going to talk about how to tie your shoes and comb your hair. And just, just, this is just really ridiculous. You wait for everybody to laugh, and they're not. They, they've got them in the deer in the headlights. That's, that's terrible. They're going to put us in their little box and criticizing anybody who walks in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ with an established salvation and uh, a wonderful new life in Christ. It's not about you. Uh, Paul took no prisoners. He chewed out Peter because Peter didn't uh, back these Pharisees down. We don't want to wound, this is a good point Dr. Rogers made in this lesson, we don't want to wound a weaker brother's conscience. We studied that, but he said, mark this, there are a lot of professional weaker brothers. That's all they want to do is get, get, add these list makers and lawmakers, not the commandments of God, the righteous commandments of God, but human lists, little laws, measurements, uh, starting a sin seeker committee and watching you real close because you've got a funny look on your face, buddy. You say, oh, how can I get out of here? Uh, <laughs> don't you ever let these people put you under bondage. Here's a good thing if you get tangled up in legalism. First, uh, pick up legs, hit that door, <laughs> let's get out of here. Uh, it's their problem. Don't let people make their problem become your problem. Uh, we had a 
cat next door. My dad came to visit us one time and the little four-year-old boy in our neighbor picked up that cat and threw it about six feet in the air right into my dad's lap. And that cat went berserk, about tore his, his arms and his legs off. Uh, do not become your problem. Do not let them toss that into your lap like that cat. People that are super legalistic and misunderstand, I hope they're saved, they may just be confused, let's be charitable. But they may think they're finishing off what Christ has done, which is insulting. But do not let them uh, make you sick in the idea that you'll help them become well. You stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Finally, again, this is the first point, and it's very long, but we're almost still about 10 or 15 minutes here. The dimensions of a life of liberty, number one, freedom from the bondage of legalism. Number two, freedom from the bondage of criticism. If we had some people that came from another group that we were in, some sort of Baptist group, and they drove up here with stern looks on their face and winds or knots in their ties, and they're dun, 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 like Joe Friday almost from Dragnet, they're gonna come up here and stop any kind of joy or any kind of fun that's going on. And here they come in the driveway and we're all trying to straighten up and everything. But now in Christ, we're free from legalism. We know the rule of the law and what it's for and what it's not for. We are now free from unwanted criticism in the sense that we're not trying to keep or earn our salvation. The last point on this first section about the dimensions of the life of liberty is the life of liberty in letting Christ save you with his righteousness and his work on the cross is that you're also free from the bondage of fatalism. Now this is interesting. Um, in Galatians 4, 3, he was talking to some people, some pagan people in Bible days that were under the oppression of uh, actually astrology, I'm going to show you, and some other things that they thought were controlling their life. Our missionaries talk to us all the time. This letter today from the Sykes about Dominican Republic, they're discipling a teenage girl. The teenage girl told them the last time she went home from their discipling class, her mother was doing a voodoo procedure to try to affect their house. And you think, oh, that's silly. It is not. It is deadly serious. Uh, this is what they did. Look in Galatians 4, 3. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, that to us sounds uh, kind of spiritual, you know, the things the world believes in. But what he was talking about was the elemental forces of nature, the stars, the planets, the world of nature. Uh, these things, instead of Christ or the God the Father being in charge of our destiny or our eternity, they believed in uh, the, the, the things of, of the world, stars, planets, nature, astrology, zodiac, stars, planet. I couldn't help it, the stars are against me. How pathetic, how ridiculous, unless you were brought up in that and you'd be fighting that the rest of your life because that's what your mother believed and that's what your sister believed. That's the idea. Look in Galatians 4, uh, 9 through 11. Let me find that here. Chapter 4, verse 9. But now, after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, I like that. We didn't initiate anything. God found us, and we have to trust him and everything, but that's true. But now, after that you're, you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements wherein ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. These people were tangled up in astrology, in prophecies, in Madame Zonga for $10 will tell you where you left your car keys. I mean, that's exactly what we have here. You remember the one over by the airport, Madame Rose, $10, 30 minutes. Uh, honk three times in the driveway so I know you're there. Well, if, you, if you're so good, how come you don't know I'm here already? If you're this uh, tarot card reader and all these, and, and we, we laugh and it's probably a good thing to, to laugh at them. They don't deserve to be taken seriously, but there are people that grew up in that, that it's very serious. Or young people that have never heard of that. You keep your kids, remember how Mark just chewed out the, the uh, games with wizards and things like that a few weeks ago? That was, he's exactly right, absolutely right. I am, Paul would say, and he wants you to say, not a victim of fate. I am what I am by the grace of God. You let me handle it, and I would have gotten into worse trouble than this. God just stepped in and said, step aside, boys. I've got this one. 
Well, that, that clears the house. I mean, everybody is running. God's taken over. So you let God, you know, when, the, when Satan knocks on the door, let God answer it. You've heard that before. That's, that is not a very deep theology, but it's good, good theology. That's wonderful. Guess what? Under legalism, you are a slave to yourself. Under criticism, you are a slave to others. Under fatalism, you are a slave to circumstances. This is bad. You need to be free of all these things. Guess what? In Christ, you're free from all. This is whom the Son hath made free is free indeed. There's other ones, but this is a great chapter, especially if you grew up in a very legalistic background or you're being tempted by your very stern neighbor, you know, talking to you over the fence. Oh, you can go down to that Baptist church all you want, but the right and true rules of God are here at the Alpha and Omega end time obey the rules church. That's where you need to go. And I think, I don't think I do. <laughs> I didn't sound like that much fun to me. God's grace is wonderful. Those are the dimensions of God's grace that handles these problems. Well, the last section is much shorter. We study the dimensions of a life of liberty. Number one, it will help you handle legalism. It obliterates the power of legalism to suggest that it could save you because it can't. Number two, it gives you freedom from the bondage of criticism. As long as you're trusting Christ, you can safely just look away from a lot of these uh, grace busters. And number three, it, it gives you freedom from the bondage of fatalism that you are not. This is especially important to our missionaries that are in parts of the world where they, are th they do think they're controlled by the moon, the stars, the planets, the seasons, the tides, the, the rites, the rituals, everything. Now, now we know the dimensions, but what are the dynamics? What is the energy that gives you the ability to have victory in your life over criticism, over fatalism, and over legalism. Well, it is the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. I'm going to show you all of this is obliterated, remade, and straightened out by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a memory verse. There's a danger to memory verses. I like memory verses, but if you, but you, you're, you get into a rhythm on memory verses, and sometimes you don't hear what you're saying after a few years. I'm not discouraging you for memory verses, but sometimes you have to slow down and say, what, what is the context of this? What are they saying exactly? Well, this verse here, Galatians 2.20, I am now crucified with Christ, Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, uh, yet not I, gosh, here, I've forgotten it already, but Christ liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that is good. Look in chapter, keep going. Uh, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That's a whole nother message. Why in the world, if we could earn it by following the rules of the Billy Bob Follow the Rules Church down the street, why did Christ have to come and die? That wouldn't make any sense. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now this uh, Galatians 2.20 basically says, when Christ died for you, you died with Christ. When he rose for you, you rose with him. The problem is, don't think it was, in Jesus Christ's cake, he, t he took the sin of the whole world on his back. He himself had not sinned, but the whole world was on his back. You're not like that. The problem is not so much what you've done, it's who you are. You need to die. You say, that doesn't sound much fun. That's exactly what Christ uh, and God the Father did on the cross is not only when Christ died for you, you died with him. You can read about that in Romans uh, 4, 5, and 6. That's good. What is the answer? How does God set us free? The cross is our statue of liberty. Number one, the cross sets me free from legalism because every demand of the law, including the Mosaic law, was met perfectly and completely in 33 years by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, walking the same earth we walk, having the same temptations that we have yet without sin. He, he fulfilled every single one of those. When Satan comes up at the end time and says, you're a lawbreaker, Christ will say, not anymore, sit down. He'll, get, he'll go right back down. 
free from the law because the law, both uh, positive and negative, was fulfilled in Christ. That's a happy condition. Number two, the cross frees me from criticism. And I think Mark talked about this the other day too. You can criticize me, but the joke's on you. I've done a lot worse things, at least in my mind, than you've brought up right there. Half of those things may be true, or 80% of them may be true, but, but you don't have any idea. I'm a lot worse than that. My little sneakiness and my little legality and little mind worrying around trying to think how I'll come out on top. I know my flesh real well. You may be a boulder. You may be out, be out in big fights and kicking around. I, I'm just, I can just see like Gollum sort of just seeing a sneaky little person. <laughs> that's, that's not good. <laughs> uh, you can criticize me. I usually deserve it. But after this, it still stands. God commendeth his love toward me. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. What do you think about that? In the balance of that, in, 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 the, in the balance of that, your criticism of me, even if it's true, it doesn't shake my world. God's already shook it a lot worse than that. A lot worse. Number three, the cross sets me free from fatalism. You say, oh, I, my, my destiny is determined by the shaking of the chicken bones and the and the howl of the wolf, and the phase of the sun, and the, the, some of those drugs they take from those plants out in the woods or have peyote or anything in it, it's kind of like LSD, or the crazy drugs I take. You say destiny, that's a pathetic destiny. I'll tell you about my destiny. I was on the heart and mind of Almighty God before this world and all you're talking about was ever created. I'm gonna trump you by seniority, sit down. You're not talking about anything. That sure beats the fire out of some planetary alignment theory or the horoscope page in the newspaper. How does this work? Will you read Galatians 2.20? I hear the bell ringing, so I'll bring it to a close. Number one, when you read Galatians 2.20, it's an executed life. You're dead as a doornail. And if you live the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's also an exchanged life. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You exchange your worthless life for his wonderful life as far as it can go on a, on a fallen earth like this. And number three, it's an energized life. He gave himself for us so that he might give himself to us. Now we can have power for living. Exchange, not spiritual push-ups, although do your best, and not positive thinking, although I like positive thinking compared to negative, I guess, but that's nothing to do with salvation. The life of God now beats within the soul of man, the life I now live, the life of, of the Son of God, his life is in me. So there's freedom and liberty and the grace of God that sets you free. That's what Christian liberty means. And Christian liberty doesn't mean you can get away with a sin as far as you can go and nobody will care. It means that you now have the power to live for Christ. You've got a chance to actually live right. That's Christian liberty. Well, we've got some more lessons coming pretty soon, but this has been a good series. Lord, thank you for today and for your grace and for the practical ways it affects our life. And help that it did it today as we heard these truths. Amen.